And as a result of that father's decision, Theodore Roosevelt became a great boxer, who then became a great uh, legislator, who then became eventually a great American president. So the point is that your life can be turned around from one occurrence, one influential person in your life. Anyway, here's a quotation from the radio of Theodore Roosevelt, which I'd like to share you. It's entitled, Man in the Arena. What is it entitled? Man in the Arena. Say that again. Man in the Arena. By the way, when I say man, I'm including woman. So just for, so you know that in law, my, my original profession is law. When we say he, in the legal document, we also mean a she. So the same way when I say man, it's for convenience, you know? So women in the, in the audience, please do not leave, do not feel left out. So anyway, here's the quotation. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles, or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by the dust, sweat, blood, and blood, who strives without error, no, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again, because there is no effort without error or shortcoming. But who does actually strive to do the deeds? Who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions? Who spent himself in, worth, in a worthy cause? Who, at best, knows in the end the triumph of high achievement? And who, at worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly? so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. This was a very, very powerful quote when I read it. And what made me love it even more is that a great American president who then came many decades later by the name of JFK, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, one of the greatest American presidents whose life was cut short by an assassin's bullet. I found out that he liked quoting this man in the arena uh, quotation. And then, uh, funny enough, I wouldn't exactly stop here, but I would start learning from this quotation and seeing how it applies. I'll take a quick picture through the two world wars, but I won't spend too much time. But then come up to 1966 when we gained our independence. And I would marvel at how the great Saratsakama and Kitu Masire maneuvered from the complexities of that to secure our freedom, which 54 years later is still intact. Can someone say Amen? Amen. And then I would say to myself, this is wonderful. But then I'll have my quick mental flight through the 54 or so years, and then I'll turn to the Almighty and say, Yes! This is the best time. This is the his exact historical epoch that I will choose. Yes, I've seen very, very many wonderful moments, historical moments. Yes! But I'll also go back to that event, those 33 years of that man who came from Nazareth. And I would see specifically the last three and a half years of his life, and I would see how the example that he set for us would apply today. Whether you are in business, whether you are in ministry, you can still be the man in the arena. And you can be empowered. And you can be empowered by the life of this great man. But a talk like this in a church would not be complete without scriptural reference. I get it. Let me find an appropriate scripture.
Who's familiar with the verse that says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me? Can somebody read it for us? While I try and find mine here. So, Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through him, Christ, who strengthens me. And then another verse, Luke 10, verse 19. Behold you, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. And then number three, he gives strength to the weary, and to, to this is Isaiah 40, verse 29. He gives strength to the weary and to him who lacks mind, he increases power. What am I really saying to you this evening? You know, I started from two kettle posts. The first kettle post was Mount Katanya. Mount Katanya was roughly 30 kilometers from where I was schooling. We would get up in the morning just for purpose of contest. The first 10 years, I was quote unquote a bastard. And I know some of you are shocked, but a bastard is actually a legal term that I learned and I was shocked to learn about that a child born outside wedlock used to be called a bastard. But of course, nowadays it's a bit improper, but it's there in the law books. I was an illegitimate child for the first 10 years of my life in the sense that I was brought up by my mother. By my mother. But a point came when it was too unbearable and too difficult for my mother to bring me and my sister up. And he took me to Ghana to live with my grandfather, um, who was a pastor of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, the great Philemon Hass. But what used to happen is that he would take us every weekend, sometimes, and certainly every holiday, to Magadana. And some of the memorable events that took place between age seven and age nine included walking barefoot to come to school in the winter with my feet cracking and blood literally coming out so that I can make it to school. In reflection, looking back, that was one of the most wonderful things that ever happened to me because it toughened me up. Because it made me realize that only when it is dark enough can you see the stars. Only when it's difficult enough can you see the light at the end of the tunnel. That experience where I lived with my grandfather and my step-grandmother, where because of the step aspect, I don't need to explain, certain things happened to me that maybe didn't happen to other children. But the point is that it was still an important experience. It lasted about three years when my mother was away at school, when I had to live like this. That experience taught me that it doesn't matter how difficult it gets, there is always a brighter tomorrow. That wasn't the only experience because uh, thankfully my parents reconciled when I was about 10 and lo and behold, my father decided with my mother to get married and they did what in law is called legitimization of the children. They legitimized me. So I'm no longer a bastard, I'm delighted to say. <laughs> Now, but still it was tough because we lived in, uh, in Gassi, we actually lived in Bunkain. Sometimes when my head gets, when I get carried away with the amount of the success that God has graced me with, sometimes I remind myself, I go down to where we grew up, where we lived with a pit like Chin. For many years it was still like that. We lived in a house divided into two for Bunkain. And then there was a pit latrine outside, and that was it, you know. Um, the parents slept this side, and the children slept this side, which also doubled up as a, as a kitchen. That was very important in terms of the experience of solidifying me and toughening me up, because I learned there and then never to complain about my and circumstances. And then, what happened during that period is that having grown up in Makatanyan, 
I then had the opportunity to grow up in another cattle post called Mahumale. What then happened is that I started going to my father's cattle post, which was 80 kilometers beyond uh, Jordan. I took over that cattle post. I'm still maintaining it uh, since I inherited it from my father. I may not go there as often as I'd like. Thankfully, I have a, a cousin brother who likes Maraca too much, so I let him take care of it. What is my point? My point is that through persistence, through faith, you can overcome any challenge. After all, the good book says that you can what? The Philippians says what? My question to you is, what is the exception to all things? What is the exception? It means you can do everything in Christ who stands for you. And the point of this is that you can do anything with faith. The thing that we don't realize, most of us, is that we already have faith. And we don't realize that we have faith. I'll give you an example of why everybody has God given faith from birth. You don't have to be a church goer to have faith. Classic example. You want to go somewhere out of the country, you go straight to an aeroplane, you buy a ticket. You have no idea when was the last time that aeroplane was serviced. You do not name, know the name of the pilot who drives that plane. You don't know how many hours he's had. You don't know his drinking habits. You do not know whether or not he's under a great deal of stress. You have no the faintest idea as to the risk that you are assuming by stepping into that plane. In addition to that, you sign a paper which is attached to a ticket which waives all your rights. And as a lawyer, you'd be shocked what sort of rights you're waiving when you sign that document. Yet, because of your faith, which you don't realize that you have, you go into that plane ticket. So theoretically, all of us have enough faith to be men in the arena, mm -hmm. to face whatever difficulty. Mm -hmm. When I faced the cataclysmic event in the early 2000s, I call it cataclysmic event because for me it was comparable to the great flood, which was comparable to the great fire uh, that wiped away uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, which is a cataclysm. The event was a group of my colleagues getting together to orchestrate my demise in the form of an application to court to have me removed as an attorney from the record of attorneys who were operating at the time. I look back at that event, I feel like going back to all my tormentors and give them a hug and kiss them on both lips. Both cheeks, sorry, not lips. <laughs> Actually, the idea of kissing now with corona everywhere is a bit disgusting. So, because if they had not uh, tormented me, if they had not tried to wipe me off the face of the earth by literally having me removed as a lawyer, I would not have stood up to them. I stood up, I had Advocate Anderson coming from Zimbabwe, from Harare. I had Advocate Wolfson coming from Johannesburg. I had Advocate Pilan coming from Botswana. I had Rek Haleman, who was then representing me, and Re, uh, who is the chief of the Wakata, Re uh, Kafel. I marshaled all my resources. I almost cleaned up all my bank accounts and made sure I paid all these people to remove the scourge from me and to, to ensure victory at all costs. And indeed, I was victorious. I won that case in that in the end, what they wanted as a suspension, what they wanted as my striking off turned out to be a suspension of my practice license. And because of the Lord that I believe in, because of this faith that I had, that suspension was then suspended. Imagine a suspension of a suspension, which means that I carry on practicing as normal. Isn't that a wonderful victory? <laughs> so it is something for which um, I, I keep reminding myself that I should be continue to be the man in the area. And why is this message so important? Look at what Roosevelt says. I, I, I want to break it down for a moment. The first thing he says, is not a critic who counts. And the question I want to ask you in analyzing this speech is that, is to ask you, how many statues have they built for critics? How many times has any critic been celebrated? And yet, how many plans, how many wonderful plans, how many wonderful ideas 
have been scattered because of some critic. Some of them waking up from the same bed that we sleep in. Some of them from the same house, from the same household. They say you can't do this, you can't do that. Do you forget what Philippians say? Do you forget that we are the men in the arena? You mustn't forget that. He says it's not the critic that counts, no, the one who points out how the strong man stumbled. You know, this fear of making mistakes. You are the strong man, you are in the arena. Huh? You are trying, you are trying to make a difference in your life. You are trying to feed your family. You are trying to make it possible for you to go on holiday. You are trying to use, to make it possible for you to stop saying Zoga Preza, Zoga Preza. To stop crying and lamenting. And you are doing all these things and someone says, look how you've stumbled. I also stumbled. And he's saying, and I agree with him wholeheartedly, it is, it is, the, it is the credit belongs to the man who actually is in the arena, whose face is marred by the dust, sweat, and blood. How many times have you fallen short? How many times have you felt like your head is almost exploding with the, with, with the pressures of this world, wanting to step back? Huh? How many times? You know, at this point I'm reminded that even the word impossible, mm -hmm. if you break it down into its proper, you add a few, you know, a few exclamation points here and there, you break it down, apostrophe after the word I, comma, and then M, and then space, possible. Even the word impossible becomes what? Impossible. I read about a guy who uh, because he was tired of people telling them how things are impossible, never, never have been done before in their family. He went to the dictionary and tore the word impossible from their dictionary. So if you remember nothing else from this talk, go back, grab those dictionaries, go to the I portion and remove the word impossible. Because if you are determined and if you believe the word that your pastor is telling you, and if you believe the scripture that is in front of you, nothing is possible. But let's go back to Roosevelt once more. more. There is no... Who, stares, who, who, who strives valiantly? In other words, the man in the arena makes mistakes, but he's doing so with valor. You understand? He strives valiantly, but here's the important part. He is... He comes short again and again and again. I did not wake up and become an entrepreneur, let alone a, a serial entrepreneur. I've had to have encounter all kinds of calamities. One of which was having my accountant clean me up. Completely clean me up. If you want to hear more of the story, go to the Nuggets of Wisdom podcast. Who has come across the Nuggets of Wisdom here? Okay. Who has subscribed? Okay, I have a lot more subscriptions. Mm -hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, can I extract an undertaking from you? Yes or no? Yes. Okay, lift your right hand. I then say your name. I. Hereby, Hereby undertake, undertake, declare, declare resolve, 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 commit, commit that once I get into a place where there's Wi-Fi, I will press a button on YouTube. I will press a button on YouTube. It says Mokobe Nuggets of Wisdom Podcast. And the minute that red sign that says subscribe, I'm going to press that button. And I declare that in a church. <laughs> so the point we can laugh about this, but the one thing that you benefit from that act is that you listen to your pastor who was uploaded this afternoon and already we're getting responses like crazy. People want to hear what he's going to say, but it's not just him. You'll have a chance to listen to Romo Homuts in France. You'll have a chance to hear my life story from the beginning. You'll have a chance to expose yourself 
to a variety of wisdom. Some of us are readers. I mean, as you can tell from my presentation, I love history, I love personal development. I am like a sponge. I'm like my friend, Mohammed in France. I read, I absorb, I apply. I read, I absorb, I apply that which works for me. And if you can start that habit, that if you are not applying your content, you're absorbing your content. If applying content, absorbing content. And content, like thank God to the period that we live in now, is available everywhere. This is one of the main reasons I turn to the Almighty at the end of that mental journey. And I say, this is the historical apple. This is the period. This is the now that I'd like you to place me and allow me to perform. Because remember, this is the age known as the Psychozoic Age. Brian Tracy calls it the Psychozoic Age. The age that mankind has been fantasizing about since the beginning of time. Throughout the areas and the history, historical period I'm talking about, the average lifespan was 30, 35 years. Maybe if you're lucky, 45 years. Uh, throughout most of the, 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 the previous century, the average lifespan was 60 years. Today, if you look out after yourself, if you don't engage in reckless behavior, it's, it's within the realm of possibility for you to, to hit 100 years and beyond. Of course, you have to live properly. And I think the added boost would be to listen to your pastor and do what he says. So, ladies and gentlemen, the man in the arena is yourself. The man in the arena is you and I.